trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Hello and welcome to episode 108 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Chris, and this is Paris. Hello. This time, we read Reaper's Creek by Onision. This appears to have been self-published in December of 2018. We read this after receiving increasing requests from our listeners over the past year to read one of Onision's books. We're kind of late to this party, to be honest with you, but... People really want to hear some re- more reviews of this dude's output, I suppose. Wait, it's not it's not Onion Sun? No, it's Onision. <sighs> okay. I've been calling him Onion Sun. Good. Everyone does actually. So you're it not just, you're not just, wrong. It's one of those things where like you just don't care enough and your brain sees all the letters that belong to <laughs> Onion Sun and it just goes Onion Sun and you don't think it That's, could be anything else because you you're don't just care. on the same wavelength as like everyone else on the internet, I assume. <laughs> that never so, I don't know. That's rare because I'm not really on the internet enough, I think, to be on that wavelength. Yeah. Even I am not on the internet enough to know much of anything about this dude besides the fact that he is some kind of proto youtuber that retained fame throughout the years because he was one of the first people to consistently upload things to very early youtube well that's a guess i don't know if that... me too <laughs> I, I think it I don't seems know. like he rose to fame because he put out a video of him having a banana costume on and screaming i am a banana to some music and that was what what got shared around a lot because you know there weren't that many things up on the early internet well, this wasn't and, even the early internet. This was like 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Sure, but like still, I feel like the internet hasn't really come in, into its own until like the rise of smartphones and whatnot, where like, you know, cameras become more ubiquitous and like increasing amount of video content. Oh, came sure, out. sure. Yeah, I just but when you say the early internet, that's like the late 1980s. <laughs> so I yeah, just wanted that, to make sure people didn't sure. think we were saying this guy was like, doing banana stuff in 1989 he was creating websites in like the mid 90s and stuff so he was still around even before then but like his Hmm. rise to prominence was early youtube he was already creating like fake cult religious websites or something in like the mid to late 90s or something oh shit is that why the fucking odontology website so bad did he make that no, <laughs> he didn't make that. I okay, so yeah, I don't really know anything about this guy. I just I have seen his name. I thought it was Onion Sun up until we read this book. Um, I really did, and uh, all I remember was like some news headline about YouTuber Onion Sun and Chris Hansen, and I was like, what? And that's the only thing I remember seeing about this guy. And Chris explained to me that. There was some legal battle with Chris Hansen of To Catch a Predator, and I I do not know anything beyond that. But if you're associated with if you're associated with Chris Hansen of To Catch a Predator, you might be a predator. (laughs) So I'm a little concerned about that, especially after reading this book. Funny story about that: he countersued. I mean, he sued Chris Hansen, not countersued because Chris Hansen was just trying to like do his Catch a Predator thing on him. Mm. But so he sues Chris Hansen for harassment. But he served the wrong Chris Hansen. Oh, that's incredible. He served another person named Chris Hansen who didn't show up to the court date or whatever because it was wrong and everyone figured out it was the wrong guy or something like that. I don't know. But uh, again, I didn't dig too deep into this because it seems like this entire dude's fame is based around drama about himself. And I don't give a shit. And we're not here to deconstruct this man's uh, lived experience. There's so many other sources for that that you could go to. 
We are a book reading podcast, and we read a book that he wrote. Yeah, I mean, we really only tend to look into and talk about authors when it it is really related to the book, and most of the time, we try to keep ourselves um, estranged from who the authors are, so that we're, you know, just focusing on the work itself. I mean. Yeah, I think the pedophilia thing is going to be re- relevant. Content I, warnings. Uh, also, the main character is clearly a self-insert, like yeah. the most obvious self-insert. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Content warnings for today include child abuse, gore, negative depictions of neurodivergent people, and pedophilia, which, of course, comes with uh, sexual assault because we just can't just can't get away for too long. Ugh. Uh, and uh, yeah, so if this is your first time listening to the show, what we do here at the Terrible Book Club is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Sometimes we also read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. So we do the opposite of what most people do when they're in a bookstore or browsing um, ebooks online. And typically this experiment results in a disappointing read, but once in a while we do end up liking the book or even loving the book at times. Um, so yeah. I think we've we've gotten our all of our preamble done. How about I read the back of the book summary and you read the summary that we wrote? Yeah. Well, how about you read the back of the book summary and the characters and settings, and then I'll read the uh sure. the summary you wrote. So the back of the book says A young boy named Daniel <laughs> encounters creatures from another world. They take him night after night into the black void of their reality till he begins asking questions. Why was he chosen? What do they want from him? Does he have to be a victim? Daniel decides to fight, and as he wages war on all those who try to harm him, he finds his own adventure. Love, loss, and chaos. This is the life of Daniel. So the back of the book says Daniel. Key key point, the name of the protagonist. (laughs) It keeps changing in the book. Okay, so when we go to characters here, (laughs) our protagonist is Daniel or possibly Greg. Sometimes it's Greg. Sometimes it's Daniel. Perhaps Gridaniel de Greg. Yeah, whatever co- horrible combination of <laughs> DeGranule or Greg <laughs> Granielig or whatever. Uh, I guess he kind of is an eldritch abomination. Okay, we'll get to that. Yeah, later. I, guess. I don't know. So yeah, he's somewhere between ten and eleven on the start of the story. All we really know is that he's in elementary school at the start. Is referred to as a young child and talks about his friend being obsessed with large breasts all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Given that he doesn't discuss moving forward to middle school after summer, he has to be somewhere between fourth and fifth grade for, I would say, a good half of the book. And then he ages up into, like, perhaps 18? freshman year of high school. No, I think he's eight. 18? No, no, no. Julie is 18. Oh, right. He is 14. Right. So, yes. so, okay. So we think 10 and then 14. Um, we're spending so much time trying to find context clues and define his age because it becomes very important later. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. And it's also things aren't exactly pinned down as concretely as you would hope about anything in this book. <laughs> yeah. About anything. I was very confused the entire time yes. about nearly everything. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, there is uh, an alien. There's multiple aliens. There's one alien who is hiding amongst Greg Daniel's classmates, referred to in the text as the special ed kid. There's really no more descriptions beyond that, so I can't give you anything else to describe this alien slash child as. Um, anyway, uh, this is one alien that is torturing Greg Daniel in his dreams, but there are other aliens as well. Yeah, that who, one's just the focus for most of the book. Who are antagonistic towards both Greg Daniel and this other alien. But that is not clear, which we'll talk about <laughs> shortly. Again, nothing is clear. No. Then we have um, uh, Greg Daniel's mom, his stepdad, his one sister, Joanna, even though there might be multiple sisters yeah, no as one knows. well. No one Do knows. you see where this is all going, y'all? Oh, there's his regular dad. There's his regular dad, who's, his biological dad, who lives in another state. There is Julia, um, his girlfriend, I suppose, later yeah. on in the text. Girlfriend is a, is um, a word. Then, That's a word we're going to yeah. talk about. 
And then God and <laughs> death. <laughs> yeah, they make an appearance. And Cull, the creator of God and death. Uh, Gary and the serial killer squad that appears 80% of the way through the book. Oh, and also all members of the band The Body. Uh, yeah. Which will... <laughs> I mean, not really, <laughs> not but really. kind of really. Uh, it's only two guys anyway, but uh, yeah. So that, you know, if you if right now you're like, wow, this is a really confusing beginning to a terrible book club episode. I don't really know what's going on. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. I have no way to make this any clearer for you guys. Well, we are... Actually, Chris, you did because you wrote the book summary. So we try to make things a little easier on listeners since, you know, most of the time, you're probably not going to read the books that we read, and it's going to make a lot more sense if you have all the plot points that we had. So Chris has written a summary that I actually have not seen yet. So <laughs> who knows? Uh, all right. So this is what happens in Reaper's Creek in a few paragraphs. <clears throat> Our protagonist, Greg, or maybe Daniel, is an elementary school-aged boy, perhaps 10, who lives with his mother and stepdad somewhere in the Midwest of America. Well, he lives in Ohio with his... Hmm. Can't his remember. Bio, his bio dad lives in Ohio. Okay, I'm not bi- sure bio where Ohio, he lives. and then he's in Washington State, I think. Okay, they mentioned all right. That. So Ohio and Washington State are our two settings. Um, it's very important that you know he sleeps above or next to or below or somewhere near a furnace and water heater in the house. This is a point that's brought up numerous times. Uh, One night, Greg Daniel starts having dreams about being abducted by a strange alien. The alien physically tortures him by doing things like placing things inside of him, removing his arm and replacing it after putting wires or something in his body or kind of just being menacing at him and screaming. Meanwhile, at school, Greg Daniel is picked on by a bully, Philip. As the dreams grow in intensity, Greg Daniel finds himself able to do and see strange things in the real world, like detect dead bodies based on the presence of a red glow that emanates from them. He finds Philip's body, who had some kind of sledding into a creek-based accident with this power, as well as lots of dead animals. Eventually, Greg Daniel finds out somehow that being under metal somehow stops the aliens in his dreams from being able to reach him. This prompts one child, who the author describes as, quote, the special ed kid, end quote, to reveal himself as a sort of protector alien, except he was the one doing all the dream torturing, so we're not really sure how that was... I don't know. The book says that Daniel, uh, Gradaniel was perceiving it as torture, but the alien was actually trying to, like, take bad things out of him from the other aliens, but then the question is, like, why didn't he remember the the initial torture and not not the... repair torture yeah anyway um things start spilling over into the real world more and more when greg daniel's mom has some kind of joint hallucinated episode of the rest of the family in which her eyes begin to bleed and explode from her head but then they actually didn't a few minutes later then there's another event where a ufo rips a hole in the home's roof like just 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 fucking tin cans that roof and sucks Gordaniel out the family experiences this and the hole is just in the roof but everyone just kind of is like yeah that happened and just like moves along um greg daniel's mother does become more distant in his perception but that's about the only thing that changes things come to a head when greg daniel re-encounters the alien masquerading as a child in an airplane after coming back from a trip to his biological father's house in which a horrendous sex scene occurs between him and a teenage girl named julie Um, horrendous because he is 10 and she is 14 and it is played as totally cool and normal and actually very positive. Uh, Greg Daniel stabs the child in the neck with a fork in the airplane. Oh, it's in, it's not in the bathroom, but sorry, in the airplane as they are deboarding to which there are no consequences, despite the fact that the child alien assumedly dies. And also that like there were, uh, plane personnel, about so i don't really know that so he just murders this kid and <laughs> just, just leaves gets away it's like peace i stabbed him in the <laughs> neck see ya that night you know in his dreams greg daniel gains the ability to simply explode the torturing aliens with his mind who knew stab a kid in the neck with a fork get mind altering powers um he in fact discovers that he seems to be able to control many things with his mind and actually project his body across the goddamn cosmos at will. He destroys the aliens and begins to live his life semi-peacefully without alien torture dreams. 
years later, Greg Daniel is basically now a reality rewriting god who has discovered that the source of his being is some kind of black stone embedded in his brain. He can read thoughts, alter the code of reality to his whims, fly anywhere at a moment's notice, etc. One day, he realizes that there are more aliens hiding amongst humans still hunting for him. He destroys them. They send a human assassin after him and Julie, who he also destroys. He grants Julie similar powers to himself after bringing her back to life when said assassin shoots her in the head. He then rewrites reality to be perfect, which is largely unexplored as to what that means except the part where Julie's dad says, so you gave women vagina teeth, huh? Which results in Greg Daniel reading his thoughts to find that he is a sexual predator and then he kills Julie's dad instantly. She's sad about it, so he flies away. <laughs> P.S. Greg Daniel's own dad is a sexual predator who has preyed on his own sister and aunts, but he doesn't destroy him for reasons unexplained. Then, Greg Daniel decides he might as well perf perfect reality by finding the source of all creation and killing it. So he finds death, and then he crushes death into a marble. Uh, then he battles and kills God uh, by creating the body, which is a <laughs> the body. I guess, sorry, y'all, you're just in this now. Um, it, God, it turns out to be multiple beings in multiple places, so he sends the body after one god, and then Gradaniel goes after the other god. The body kills one part of god, gains more power orders, and comes back to aid Gradaniel in killing the rest of god. And then, after all this god murder, they find out that Cull is actually the real, the ultimate god, who is god's dad. Cole created God, and then the first daughter. <laughs> I'm hearing you become further unraveled. Oh. <laughs> and then, so then they, for some reason, Gradaniel is like, let's take pity on Cole instead of killing him. So he like brings back the daughter God to life. Does she even get a name? No, it's just like Fuck. the okay. daughter go God daughter. She. Uh, I think she was supposed to be like the Earth Mother or something. Yes. And it's just the, so he brings the Earth Mother back to life, and Cole is like. Thank you. I guess you can have control of everything, Shrug. And then Greg Daniel asks Julie to help him kill God. And she's like a little bit reluctant since it's like kind of a tall order for this, <laughs> for this girlfriend you like just thrusted powers upon. Eventually, Greg Daniel and Julie and the body work together to kill God. Oh, I already said this. Revive the daughter God of Carl and return to the perfect reality that Greg Daniel has created. Yeah, all that happened in like 190 pages or 195 pages. It really Ooh. goes wild at about after page 105 or so with this like very Eclipse of Darkness flavored stuff. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't heard episode 50 of Terrible Book Club, The Eclipse of Darkness, uh, we recommend we recommend that one if you want to understand the uh, cosmic horror flavoring of this particular text. So, um... Uh, yeah, okay, things let's, we Let's things come we like. down from that things. for a second for us, Paris. Before we even get into that, let's just kind of, like, everyone take a deep breath, like, activate your archangels or whatever. Yeah, maybe, and... like, maybe like get your ass Bible out and, like, <laughs> consult it. Or, I don't know, get a coffee, take a five-minute walk, yeah. come back, come back to us. <sighs> okay, I am. All right. All okay, right. Everyone good? All right. All right. So things we liked about it. So I personally, what I liked about this book is that when I turned a digital page, it actually turned three pages, which made me feel like I could be done with this book faster than usual. <laughs> that was actually a fantastic part of this book, Paris, is yeah. that I got through it mercifully quickly. Yeah, it was, it was not very long and it was very, <laughs> despite, so c confusingly, even though it was like terribly written and hard to parse it was easy to read because it was like well it doesn't really matter how much attention i pay to this also yeah. these words are just strung together meaninglessly so it's fine um, i can just turn my fucking brain off and like yes. go with this dude's basically power fantasy for a 12 year old and, of a book and then i just made a bunch of notes about how weird everything was and there's so many notes y'all so many notes so oh, yeah God. nothing about this was particularly good um I think there was one oh. line in here that I enjoyed. Okay, so there was one single yes, sentence where I was like, that's kind of okay. And he's doing his, like, I'm an edgy atheist child and I'm, you know, <laughs> talking yeah. shit about going to church, which, whatever. So was I, still am in a way. Yeah, same. Um, and so he has one line at the end of a paragraph <gasps> that was like, well, 
God is really just the guilt that we name that brings us, you know, to church to every Sunday or whatever. And I was like, okay, there's something there. Oh, but also, you made it. You made it way more eloquent than it actually was. Yeah. So, but like at the same time, okay, that line might mean something if literal God didn't exist later in the book. Yeah. Yeah. So you were also wrong in that reality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, so we got a lot to get through here. First, I just want to talk about the technical writing. Um, it is awful. This is, this, uh, well, I mean, there's really no nice way to put it. I mean, this book is actually just a very underdeveloped first draft of ideas that was not edited or if, or if it was, it was edited poorly. Um, there are numerous spelling errors, grammatical issues. There's no, there's no real style here. Uh, I, I really doubt that anyone other than the author even looked at this before it was published. Beyond the technical errors, you know, the most heinous writing sin here is the lack of consistency. I mean, we've talked about how the, the main character's name is sometimes Daniel and sometimes Greg. And before anyone is like, oh, but what if it's like an unreliable narrator and he's like crafty and he's tricking you? No, this guy just <laughs> no. can't keep his shit straight. It's a, it's a rough draft of ideas. It's not a book. So, you know, it's not a clever... A clever writing uh, trick. It's just bad. Uh, for you know, so we have Daniel is sometimes Greg. Uh, his girlfriend Julia is sometimes Julie. For well, and now we can talk about the non-Euclidean sleep house appliance non area. Non-Euclidean sleep appliance house area. So one of the things that's inconsistent and like weirdly constantly brought up in the first probably half of the book is that Greg Daniel, um. His, and I still am not really sure why his bedroom <laughs> is in the like, uh, what do you call the basement room? A furnace utility room, room furnace mud room. room. Mud no, room no, 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 no. Mud room is something totally different. This is like a furnace room where there's a furnace, your washer and dryer, water heater. You know, a room in your basement that has all your like house, a uh, really organs. core. Yeah, yes, <laughs> your core house organs. So for some reason, Greg Daniel's room is within the core house organs here, um, and he loves to talk about this. But at first, he's like, oh, I live in a, a bed that's chained above the heater in the basement. But then later, it's in front of the heater in the basement, and he just keeps talking about this weird chain bed, and then there's like a window under his bed, and I just... Why? Would where is the bed? Where do you sleep? Why is this driving me nuts trying to determine exactly <laughs> where you are in the sleep area that you also like play video games and have like a TV set up in? Yes. He says he lives in this tiny space with just his video game stuff and his bed. But yeah, and I, and I just keep thinking like because at the beginning of the book, he he there's a little forward and it makes it pretty clear that some of the things in this book are things that really happened to him. I'm going to guess it's not the alien abductions and stabbing a kid on the plane and murdering him. It's probably things like this where maybe he had a shitty bedroom as a kid or something. But yeah, it's really confusing. And I also don't understand why he keeps bringing it up. Yeah, why it's like it comes up a lot. As to, I think maybe he didn't like that if this was a really th thing that really happened to him. Also, again, maybe it's you could maybe go like, oh, it's part of the whole thing because he's a weird eldritch god entity in the end or something, and <laughs> perhaps he's mentally rewriting reality around him. Around him, even no, no it's not. No. It's not presented like that. It is not revealed to be that. It is simply he is sometimes above the heater or next to the furnace. Or and again, even if he had some clear idea in his head that you were supposed to get as the reader, if you're not communicating it to me effectively where despite the fact that you bring it up seven or eight times throughout the text, I still don't know where your fucking bed is, dude. Yeah, like, I couldn't, I couldn't reconstruct this room if you asked me to. I wouldn't know where to put anything. And, and the further question is, like, how is your mom's house in the country in the middle of nowhere so small that you have to live above the washing machine and in front of the heater? When you only have one sister. And one mom and a stepdad. I don't know. Maybe maybe the house only had two bedrooms and they were like, let's chain the sun above the heater. Like, I don't know. That seems. 
sleep on the couch maybe yeah i mean i mean again it's like i'm not i'm not like house shaming anyone it's just yeah, yeah it's just a very particularly odd thing to have in a book for no reason and also to not even have it be clear makes it's it weird even to have weirder. it harped on so much yes. that i'm in this dingy basement thing but you still don't exactly clearly describe to me that it, if it's such an integral part of the the kid's upbringing and the vibe in his life that he feels maybe chained in here literally or it's like you know a sort of claustrophobic feel yeah you should give me a decent descriptor of it where i'm not utterly confused as to how it feels and where you are physically in space right and this is something that happens many times with other things this is just an example <laughs> yeah it's perhaps the most egregious one but when i don't know it, when you're flying across the, the the Americas or even through space, I don't know if that's your real body or an astral projection. Yes, it's very confusing. Sometimes it seems to be a spirit astral projection because he talks about his body becoming comatose or, you know, just standing still. But yeah. other times he's really doing stuff with the physical body. So again, everything is inconsistent. There are very few threads to follow through this book. I mean, and, and that's right down to the writing. So like I said, I started off this part talking about the technical writing. And, you know, the inconsistency is there even in sentences. We have awkward structure and strange syntax. Like, okay, I'll just, I'm just going to read the paragraph. This is a paragraph. Summer this year was strange, dot, dot, dot. There was a girl there. When I looked at her, it felt like she was staring right through me. She had curly brown hair. Her parents were both from Latin America. She was so cute. She was my favorite part of church every Saturday and the entire state of Ohio itself. At this point, she is my main reason to return next summer as I have no idea what to do with my father. Joanna just says ditto whenever she talks to my dad on the phone after he says he loves her. I wonder if he has caught on to the fact that she says that because of the things my mom told her about her biological father, things I might think I think might be true. So in that <laughs> smattering of sentences... He goes from talking about this girl at church he has a crush on. And then he starts talking about Joanna. And it makes you think Joanna is the girl he has a crush on. But then you're very confused because Joanna, you know, his dad is telling Joanna he loves her on the phone. And then he's saying there's some weird stuff going on with his biological father. And you, I was, I didn't, I was like, what does any of this mean? But then as you read, he explains that Joanna is actually his sister and the girl he has a crush on is not his sister. So it's <laughs> why would you write the paragraph like that without ever first introducing your sister and giving us the name of the girl you have a crush on? Like it's the you structure is something bizarre. of a break that you could have even just hit enter and put the sentence with Joanna in it as a different paragraph. To maybe insinuate that it's a different idea. Or it still would have been sentence, confusing. But it would still be pretty confusing. It you hmm. Yeah, I mean there's there's all I could just honestly, I'm just gonna click yeah. and then I'm gonna stop when I see a note from myself. Um oh, I actually I, made notes every time his name changed, and then I just got tired because it yeah. kept happening. Um oh, okay. <clears throat> How uh he's waiting at the bus stop with his sister and uh, a friend. How long have you been waiting? Joanna asked Michelle. About nine years, it feels like, Michelle replied. The bus came around the corner moments later. I looked to Michelle and said, huh, guess we got lucky with our timing. She immediately replied, shut up. Suddenly, the bus exploded into thousands of pieces. Michelle was littered from head to toe with shrapnel and went flying over the side of the hill. Joanna was screaming in horror from her own wounds as Michelle jolted around, spitting up blood and screaming, vacation, vacation now. <sighs> I know, I should apologize. That didn't really happen. However, I imagine stuff like that all the time. <laughs> I just ah uh, yeah I don't know um I guess you're supposed to take that as like oh he's a little off kilter right right or something like he's a little crazy guy I'm the Joker baby I don't know like, uh, yeah I, I don't know uh there's also this awkward paragraph I my teacher pushed in the VHS and at first everything seemed normal. It was a generic film about the reptiles that lived on Earth long before humans. No big deal. However, the narrator began talking about an idea that had no real scientific value that I could think of. He asked, what if a human was combined with a dinosaur? Hearing this, I immediately scoffed. My condescending reaction was muffled quickly by the image they showed after. It was the alien from his dreams. <laughs> 
They called it a dinosaur human DNA splice, but it was almost identical to what I dreamt of before. The face that haunted my imagination was realized to the physical world. This was the first time I had seen anything like it with my own eyes. Immediately, I stood up and left the classroom. The teacher didn't remember my name yet, so she yelled after me, Um, student? <laughs> I was the first day of school, I think. I ignored her and walked toward the principal's office. I was lost in horror and thoughts of how the rest of the class reacted. It was like none of them had seen him before. The alien. Why was I the only one who seemed upset? Why would they show that to such young kids? Why did they show that to me? <laughs> Why would you be that, like... So he's saying that his teacher, on the first day of school, put a movie in... Like, a co weird conspiracy theory film that was like, what if dinosaurs and aliens? And then it happened to be the exact image of the alien that he was seeing in his dreams. I don't... That doesn't really work for me. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. It's just like a weird extra trauma layer that he's trying to put in as to, you know, why he doesn't fit in in school, maybe? Okay, he here, here's another couple pages later. Um... My mom turned to me and asked how I was. I replied, the teacher showed me a picture of an alien on a video and I cried. My mom's face went from curious to angry in seconds. She replied, they showed you a scary alien at your age? <laughs> and his mom goes to the school and is like, I can't believe you showed this to my young child. So, okay, so he's, it's too scary to see an alien in school... But he can totally <laughs> have a teenager have sex with him later. Yeah, it's totally fine. Too young to see a dinosaur. Totally fine to have sex. Cool. That's the book. Uh, anyway, so the inconsistencies are really bizarre. I was just trying to read some passages so you can see how they were not written very well. Um, th there's another problem in this book where there's a focus on these mundane scenes rather than fleshing out things that are actually interesting or traumatic or need more care. For example, his mom's eyes explode and it's only like two paragraphs. Then we get a play by play of him being on an airplane or eating a sandwich. Like it's just, <laughs> it's very weird. Or, or like, yeah, just like the, a, a day in school where a bully picks on him, which I suppose is again, supposed to illustrate how put upon this child is not only in his dreams, but in his day to day as well. But it, it doesn't end up mattering in the long run if this all develops into you becoming a reality rewriting god where Philip the bully doesn't really matter. Also, there's the one aspect of him being able to see dead bodies by that red glow, but then that just goes away. It's, just, it's yeah. The ability just disappears with no rhyme or reason or explanation. Yeah, and then and once the, he has... Then finding dead bodies doesn't matter. Yeah, and then at the end, he does find a bunch of dead bodies, but it's through his reality rewriting god powers when he just walks through the soil and finds a bunch of dead women. And then there's, like, a serial killer. So I think we're supposed to think that the earlier bodies, like the, the kid's accident and all the dead animals were the work of this serial killer, but he never ties that together at all. Were we supposed to think that? I mean, that makes sense to me. It's no, called we Reaper's Creek. <laughs> It's called Reaper's Creek, even though it's not about the murders at all. They're just there. There's extra. There's confetti. I don't, I think the <laughs> Shit confetti. serial murder guy squad was completely unrelated to the bully dying. And all the mutilated animals? I think those were just naturally dead animals. And then the bully just happened to have a sledding accident of some kind. But why would it be called Reaper's Creek if there weren't a bunch of tied together murders around the creek? But the the <laughs> serial murder guy only murdered women. Yeah, but the idea I think is that he must have started with animals and then a kid and then. Moved Why would up he to murder a ch small child I in a know. creek by shoving his sled into the creek? I don't know. Paris, there's no way that's supposed to be connected. You're trying to find a thread of something, and it's called Reaper's Creek because he named it midway through yeah. when there was just dead bodies in the river, and later death itself shows up and is destroyed. By the way, the implications of you removing the entity of death from reality yeah, are never explored. There's never yeah. a mention of, like, is everyone immortal now? Do you have to die if you don't want to? Yeah, it's very... Like I said, this is just a bunch of very rough ideas that are underdeveloped. It is not a book. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> overall, so overall, 
we have this very immature quality to the whole thing, but it's not intentional. It's not as though the author was trying to mimic immaturity and make the book seem like it was written by, you know, a scatterbrained 10 year old. The sense I get is that the author is this immature, disorganized kid. Um, even though he's in his, I think he was in his thirties when he wrote this. Yes. Right. So, unfortunately, it's not. Again, it's not a clever like. Oh, I'm going to write this like a kid. It's not well written by an adult. It's it's basically a narcissistic power fantasy about getting to rewrite reality to what you deem to be the perfect version of it without even really explaining what that perfect version means besides, I guess, being able to explode the brains of sexual predators. Yeah, and we'll come back to that. And, and like, reasons. I guess removing death from reality maybe, or like a, a god that doesn't care for his creations, but yeah. we never get an examination of like beyond, I guess, vagina teeth as mm -hmm. to why crime would be lower he says crime is lowered and like yeah there's like one oh, sentence where okay. he's like there's less crime now because i made it that way and i rewrote people's like biological imperatives to make them more likely to defend themselves uh, yeah i mm, unclear very unclear so and and so what is the conflict in this book paris right like he is a put upon child by both bullies and uh, aliens in his mind. Mm -hmm. And then he spontaneously gains the ability to rewrite reality at will f without earning it. Besides, I guess, stabbing a, a, a special, uh, a neurodivergent child in the neck. Oh, yeah. Is the only catalyst. Act like that is like his tripping point to finally like accepting himself as a fully realized God. And then he can explode alien brains and within a few years um, rewrite Literally, again, I keep saying this because that's what he can do. He's, he can just change. He calls it altering the code of reality. He even puts it in the context of, like, when he's rewriting people's biological imperatives. He's like, I treated it like a video game. I increased mm -hmm. their HP and stamina, yes. which is a perfect example of this being written by, like, a person with a child's brain. Mm -hmm. If that's how you're couching this is as... <laughs> Again, that goes back to your point of how it seems like the person that wrote this is the immature person when we don't get deeper examinations of anything besides. And then I became an all powerful Super Saiyan God. He does go Super Saiyan, by the way. He yeah. just like one spontaneously gains blonde hair and powers up and gains bigger muscles in one scene. Yes. For reasons. Yeah, I. Uh... I I'm just getting increasingly louder and higher pitched because I. Oh, Chris, you're about to become a, real, a reality <laughs> rewriting God. <laughs> Uh, my butthole has teeth in it now. Ugh, there it goes. You can't get my butt anymore, everyone. Not that it was being threatened, but I feel insecure in that way. So therefore... Uh, my favorite part about the vagina teeth is when he explains that he gave women vaginal teeth because men have swords. So I just figured women could have something too. It's like, yo, dude, women can also wield swords. I don't know if you know is this. Women have thing? arms and hands. And even okay. if... Like, what? Couple of uh, no, I think the swords thing was like penises. It's a penis thing. Uh, no, Did you not no, get that, Paris? Chris, no, it's, it's not, a penis thing. No, it's not a penis thing. Yes, it is, Chris. You don't defend yourself with your penis. But that's like the way he, to him. He's men have about, the weapon no, of no, penis no, which penetrates. No, no, I'm going to the note. I'm finding the note. <laughs> Paris, Chris. we're both having extremely no. different interpretations. Oh. But okay, okay, but then why would vagina teeth help you unless like you're attacking muggers with your vagina? No, he's saying that women. Oh God, I hate to even explain this logic because it's not one that I. I need your. Ex I need okay, your explanation of your what interpretation. He's, what he's saying is like, I'm helping women not get sexually assaulted because I'm putting teeth in their vaginas. Clearly, this is a very um poor interpretation of what sexual assault is and he explains that he did that because men have swords to defend themselves so women should have vagina teeth to defend themselves i am finding the note please hold another question here um are the vagina teeth retractable um un unknown i would assume unknown. they would have to be if you wanted procreation to take place unless you 
pulling death out of existence means there's no more babies ever because of vagina teeth, and we don't need them anyway because everyone's immortal. Uh, hang on, I'm I'm in the I'm in the <laughs> stabbing child in the neck on the plane. Uh, I, Harris, no, like it doesn't make sense to have the the self defense mechanism be vagina teeth unless that men have swords thing was supposed to be a penis metaphor to me. I don't. I'm almost there. Almost there. <laughs> um, ah, here we go. All right, I've arrived. I've arrived. Ahem. He spouted out. So women have teeth on their crotches now, eh, Daniel? In the middle of drinking my lemonade, I tried to swallow without a hiccup. Clearing my throat, I replied. Yes, I thought that would make sense. Her dad looked concerned. What do you mean? I replied sincerely. I mean, men have their swords. Women should have their blades too, right? Julia's father gave me a sarcastic look. Oh, you're one of those. I giggled slightly and said, one of... And then quickly went silent mid-sentence. In that moment, I saw into his mind without even inquiring. I saw all the women he hurt. He'd even attacked Julia's friends when she was younger. He was a serial predator, and the moment I realized what he was, he dropped dead, face falling flat in his noodles. Ta-da! It's still... It, I think that's a penis metaphor, Paris. I know, because they're, he's talking about keeping people safe. Not... From the predators that men are... It's all in the sexual predator, you know, th- thing here is what he's talking about. Also, another point. D- I don't does know. Everyone I don't just, know does everyone just know that Greg Daniel rewrote reality? Because if Julie's dad know, did he, I forget, did he like. It says, it says he did not know that. But I don't know how he wouldn't know that at this so, point. So wait, so he's spontaneously at the dinner table. Bringing up, hey, did you hear about those vagina teeth that yes, they have now? Correct, correct. Yes. Why would you bring that up at the dinner table? Because this book is a fucking fever dream. <clears throat> P- Paris. <laughs> yes. Paris. I no. It has to be that he knew. No, you it wouldn't... it distinctly says him. At dinner, Julia's father had a lot to say about the changes I made to the world, not knowing I played any part in it. It's written in the text. All right, I guess I just erased that from my mind and attempt to erase something from this book from my mind. But, so why would you go like, hey, what's up with those vagina teeth? Um, 14-year-old at this point, I think. Uh, yes, I think he's 14 now, correct. Why is the dad cool with his 18-year-old daughter seeing a 14-year-old boy? Yeah, that's a great question, especially when they were 14 and 10. Do we want to just talk about that right now? I don't think he knew about that when that part happened. No. But they Okay, been... but yeah, let's talk about that part right now. Okay, yeah, now we get to talk about kids having sexual contact in media. Uh, uh, what a wonderful okay. podcast we have, Paris. <laughs> All right, look, like... Obviously, kids having sexual contact is like a thing that happens, even if children aren't ready for it. And of course, media, including books, are not things where like everything has to be perfect. All, like everything has to be ideal, right? Oh, oftentimes, we use media to um, discuss and deal with things that are traumatic or problematic. <laughs> so again, the inclusion of this is not the problem. It's the treatment of it in the work. So when Daniel is 10, he has a sexual interaction with Julia, who is 14. And that age gap, four years, is pretty big when you're 10 and 14. Yeah, that's there's a lot of stuff that happens between those ages. Yeah. Um, There's so many things that happen, like mentally, physically. I'm sure you all know about puberty, right? Yeah, so... It's uh, it's disturbing, at least it was to us, that a 14-year-old girl would be preying upon a 10-year-old boy in this way. Um, you know, they. I mean, I hate, I got I don't want to go too in-depth, uh, but there's, there's some uh, foreplay, let's say, and some yeah, kissing sure. and things. Yeah. But, you know, it's... Um, it's like, you know, it's not like Greg Daniel in his 10-year-old mindset was weirded out by it right but it's still predation because he's 10 and he doesn't really understand what's happening 
Yeah, but instead of it being presented as like traumatic or something the character needs to deal with, he's just like, it was the greatest day of my life, essentially, and talks about how positive and wonderful it is and about how he and Julia go on to date, you know, until he's like the go- a god in the universe and he makes her a god too. And it's just glossed over and it's featured as totally positive and normal. Oh, never Paris, reflected I'm just on. having a realization. I'm just having a realization here. What is it? Is it the scene where Julie gets murdered and he brings her back to life and then they have sex a bunch? That's when he's still 10. No. He is, no. That's later. Okay, okay. I, okay, just wanted to, I guess I needed to have that detail cleared up for me. No, for but sec- he does. There is a statement in the text that says, it's a couple of years later. Just so you know, Julie and I have gone all the way multiple times. <laughs> that's how it's, that's word for word, Fuck guys. Me. So this 14-year-old kid is like, yeah, I totally have had been having sex with this woman that's four years, four years older than me since I was 10. Like, that is so, so bad. <laughs> um, I And again, like, if it was something that happened that he had to deal with and you were exploring the trauma of that with him and, like, him grappling with it, it wouldn't, it would be fine to include. I'm not saying you can't include things that are, awful in text i mean we read a book about a woman that fucked a bear like we've yeah. read all kinds of crazy things i we wouldn't w- even say it has to be necessarily put as 100 percent traumatic in the text just like an examination of what that did to you having that experience very young that's that's what i'm saying like there needs to be some reflection even if right even if maybe even if the character at the time doesn't understand that because how would they they're 10 most kids wouldn't like you would hope that the author would be like, years later, I realized how much this fucked me up because this, this, and this, ABC, you know? It. I don't even, again, but Paris, I don't even need the paragraph to, like, have the character stating, this fucked me up. It, I just, like, how that affected you at all in yeah. terms of, you know, having that happen to you at a very young age instead of, it was rad, the end. Yeah, it, so, so it unfortunately perpetuates these really... Um, I would say terrible cultural ideas that we have in in America and Western society where it's okay for um I don't want to say prepubescent that sounds kind of weird but it's where it's okay for older women to prey on younger men but everyone thinks it's gross when older men prey on younger women like or I'm sorry when <laughs> Older women, older females prey on younger males because this is obviously not this. Yeah. We're talking about two kids here, but I still feel like when you're 14, it's pretty obvious you shouldn't be having sex with a 10 year old, right? Like, is yeah, that a thing what, that's not clear? Is that a thing what that's like 14 year old in okay, so like sophomore uh, in high school, right? Like around or the, freshman, f- freshman or sophomore in high yeah. school is like looking over at the middle schoolers being like, oh shit. Well, no, elementary school. This kid was in elementary school, not middle yeah, school. Yeah, so like not even middle school. Yeah. It's... So there's not even like a mild examination of how Julie slash Julia might be pretty messed up to like. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. There's, so there's that. So, yeah. Again, uh, <laughs> Paris. The, the child sex is bad because of the treatment in the text. Paris. <laughs> this is. Another realization, Too Far was a way better version of, like, a sort of child romance thing happening than this. Yeah, and even that, I was not a huge fan yeah. of. Like, I did think that book had merits. I was actually like, hey, this book wasn't the worst. It at least, like, um, explored some of the, like, consequences yeah. around that, which puts it on many many levels above what's happening here yeah and in the book it was pretty clear that like the kids were traumatized by their parents whereas in this book it's just said oh yeah our dads are sexual predators but then like nothing (laughs) comes nothing deeper than that no um so yeah it's it's uh, yeah like i said it just perpetuates these really terrible norms that we have between uh, where we see you know, where we see younger men or children, excuse me, we see young child boys, boy children. <laughs> That's usually what boy is. Yeah. A child. Boy, boy children. Good to have sex with older lady. 
like how is like that is just a thing in our society that's like <sighs> cool man not there's okay this, there's so many lines where he tries to seem cool around her too there's one mm-hmm. line where it's like and i was so much taller than her it was perfect what like yes. what the fuck yeah when he then transforms the- when he goes super saiyan he gets a he i don't know he talks about how he's tall at the beginning but then he gets taller and yeah he's like <laughs> oh man I'm so much taller than this girl it's so good and then he's like posing outside her window when he flies over to her mm-hmm. house and he's trying to make the lighting seem cool. He's, after, he's like <laughs> after he revives her from death, mm-hmm. he, he's like covered in blood from murdering the assassin. And he's like, and it's not just your blood I'm drenched in, darling. And you can hear the fucking sunglasses come down. Uh, like, I guess uh, the sunglasses come down and just cut his nose off. And just keep going. <laughs> just keep going. That's how it, that's how it sounds. Yeah, he was like, I, I tried to position myself to look as cool as possible, and she looked out her window. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, again, just, like, childish shit, right? Like, this is an extreme- How did a man in his 30s write this and then go, yeah, I should tell other people about this. I should it let other literally people reads, see this. Like, it literally reads like something a 12-year-old write after playing a bunch of Japanese RPGs down to, like, he mentions Final Fantasy VII in this book a couple yes. of times. Oh, and, and, uh fucking uh snake fucking metal gear snake. solid metal gear solid yeah. <laughs> as like wonderful works of art like okay guy they're like rad games i guess but they're not like some pinnacle of fucking like creative masterwork final Fantasy 7 has a pretty good story metal gear solid is like a cool homage to like american action movies in an absurd way but in no way should you be like couching those as like s- something to allude to in this story mm-hmm. and like down to even like we have a go- killing god final battle and going Ugh, super saiyan yeah. that is 100 percent some 12 year old i just watched a bunch of anime shit to this put book, in your book this book is the most like it's like concentrated toxic masculinity like if you needed to buy a jug of toxic masculinity <laughs> and like concentrate to like fill up your other jugs your spray bottles like that's what this would be i mean just think about it you've got power fantasy you've got killing god you've got becoming tall buff and blonde you've got i'm the protector of all women because i get rid of the sexual predators for them also women are never sexual predators it's totally fine that my 14 year old girlfriend had sex with a 10 year old me like like that's also part of that because it's this whole yeah only (laughs) Only men are strong enough to be evil, I guess. I don't know. I'm not really sure where that comes from, but it is really weird that, you know. Fe- yeah, because even the like, female god is the one that is good, right? Because Cull fucks up by making like a worse god. It's true. And the male god is the one that creates imperfect beings in an imperfect world. Mm-hmm. He also says some kind of fetishy stuff about his teacher in the beginning about how she has very large breasts. And Always about the something. big Bogambos, this kid, for some reason. Uh, yeah. Well, weirdly, he says that he didn't really understand why his friend was so into big breasts, but then he also talks He's about always breasts. talking about yeah, the big uh, Hanukkah Donaloos that are out there. Yeah. So anyway, this book is just an amalgamation of a lot of really um, unfortunate <laughs> trends. <laughs> Can we t- oh. are, we're just going to start careening here, Paris, much like yeah. this book. Why is there a protector alien and then not good aliens, but the protector alien would, like, giggle at him and pull pranks on him in real life? As well, the, the protector alien would also threaten him in real life, never explain to him that he was protecting him. He shouts at one time when he's like, don't sleep under metal, it'll stop me, but not them. Well, yeah, I... But it does stop them, doesn't it? No, they just ripped the roof off his house. Oh, that's... yeah. So I don't, anyway, yeah, I mean, let's talk about the quote unquote protector alien that doesn't really seem Uh, like protecting. Um, Yeah, I mean, treating, (laughs) making the, I hate to say this, but it's just what the character is called, making the quote special ed kid an actual alien is like the most othering thing in the world. We don't need to treat neurodivergent people as actual aliens. Like, that already happens on a day-to-day basis. Please, please make your alien characters someone else. Let's just not do that. It's it's like you didn't even think about this. And there's even a line in the book where you know he's thinking about it because he says, you can't even talk about the special ed kids without getting in trouble 
people are overly sensitive about like there is a line that's like that. not yeah that's not the problem dude it's the fact that the way you use it is as paris put it the most othering possible thing in existence when you're like there's this weird kid in class and uh, and turns out he's a fucking alien from another planet is how you're going to put it he's not human yeah my god like and also saying god just i calling the character special ed kid never giving him a name never describing him beyond that like people that think and <laughs> people whose brains work differently from you know from yours deserve to have agency and identity beyond that person different <laughs> like it's just it's really terrible i mean and again this what this is one of the things that makes me think that no one else must have seen this before it went to print right because how or if could they anyone... did they were just like yeah cool go ahead and offered no criticism or advice it doesn't seem like this guy would be the one to take criticism no yeah and it's it's an example of something that just was not thought through you know before <laughs> before he put this work into the world make the alien anyone else make it anyone else there were even other normal people that were actually aliens that they acted completely normal yeah so you knew that could be a possibility too but yet you just decided to have the like the main alien that we see all the time be the neurodivergent person yeah and the other thing is like you know if the counter to this argument of ours is well he was the protector one it's like well you didn't make that clear he was torturing him all the time terror he was torturing him in his sleep and not telling him that he was trying to help him and terrorizing him at school by scaring him all the time. So it, it didn't really work out that way. And then, and then of course this character gets murdered because of course they do. And it's, and that even as we put, have said before is the turning point in which the protagonist can now fully come into his reality rewriting powers. By the way, at the end, it turns out like he was divinely concepted by the daughter God character or something. Mm, like I that's don't know why, if that's clear. No, the, yeah, that's 100% was what it's put at because do you remember the body going like, ew, you thought your mom was hot? Because yeah, but he I think sees he was the just daughter saying, God. But I think, he, I think he was just saying that because she's like the mother of all creation. No, it is no. because he was specifically the reason he has oh. these powers is because he like the daughter god even though she was dead created him somehow again Paris you know what you might be right fuck it I don't care oh, oh wait, no, 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 no. Here, here, hang on hang on the body exploded with another discovery following the very same code even further back Daniel your physical code starts at the date of your birth but the stone in your head has a code that was created much further back with your mother your original mother. My eyes darted up at the body. I replied with less shock and optimism than the body. My mother is the new god of Earth. Yeah, so I guess so, you're right. Yeah. Also, can uh, when he creates the body, he's like, oh, I've created this other version of me that is only the good parts of me, is how it's put, I think. I don't. If you can remember I, reality, yeah. can't you like, kind of just turn yourself into that, maybe? Uh, yeah. Well, I think he needed a replica of himself because God was in multiple places. But it's not like you had to like uh, kill them all at the same time. Look, Chris, this is a video game. It's a time <laughs> trial, okay? A time trial. Oh, my God. Um, what, uh, what makes sense in this book? Like, give me one thing that you coherently, cohesively can say was the concrete truth. This author, <laughs> this author clearly has some unresolved issues with child sex abuse, and that is very clear because it keeps being brought up, but it is never actually dealt with in the book. Okay. Um, That's how, the concrete thing I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. I, do we have anything else here at this point, Paris, besides, like, random snippets of, like, weird shit that was in here? Oh, yeah, I'll go through the notes randomly in a minute, but um, I did want to go back to our point about making, you know, someone who's neurologically atypical and alien and why that's a problem. I'm not saying that you can't have a, a villain who is neurodivergent, but, like, people, <laughs> when you have a population, whether it's 
because of their neurological makeup or their race or gender, who is, who is constantly <laughs> thought less of and oppressed in real life, Maybe don't make them the villain all the time in your media because people do that all the time anyway. You know, it's one of those things where there a lot of nuance is needed to handle this appropriately, much like a lot of things in this book. You know, there's all these things brought up that are that need more of a nuanced, uh, serious treatment, and they're just not given it. Um, so I don't I don't want to say, oh, we're telling you you can never do this, but I mean, if you if you <laughs> if you live in the world. <laughs> with other people and there's context around you. Maybe look at the context before you make this decision in your work about making someone who is a quote, special ed kid, an alien that you ultimately murder because it's not a good look. <laughs> it's not a good look. Not a good look. Oh. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and uh, spoilers for WandaVision. If you haven't <laughs> yeah. seen that show, this is where we're going to talk about WandaVision because it kind of relates to this story. All right, yeah, three, like, two, one, fuck you. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like, I... <laughs> I like that, that your spoiler, like, warning. <laughs> three, two, one, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. Um, so, uh, Chris and I have both recently watched WandaVision. Um, I actually was not a huge fan, but the reason this is relevant is because this is that is a show about someone with reality rewriting superpowers <laughs> and i didn't much like that show but it is much better than this version right like at least it sort of examines some consequences of like resting control from people through your reality rewriting power yeah i was gonna say like i didn't like it for a variety of reasons that we don't need to get into because this isn't the wandavision review podcast i'm sure there's already eight podcasts about the fucking show oh there's twenty thousand. <sighs> I, yeah, no, I'm not a fan, but I, I did watch it because I was lied to about the premise. <laughs> I was learning and then I'm a completionist, you know, obviously I do this show. Um, so I figured I'd just watch it in full. So I did, but, um, yeah, like at least that show tries, tries, it makes an attempt to be like, <laughs> hmm, maybe being a reality rewriting superhero isn't all it's cracked up to be. Uh, maybe if you have a world literally based on code that you can change at will, and used to enslave people. Maybe that's not that's so There's good. There's some ramifications yeah. and consequences to that. It's not as simple as going, and then I made it perfect. The end. Yeah. <sighs> All right. WandaVision talk over. Luckily, there um, weren't even that many spoilers in that, but still. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's only a spoiler if you've only watched, like, two episodes. If you yeah. somehow got through those first two episodes without clawing your fucking eyes out. Oh, God. Anyway. Um, I'm looking at my notes right now because I'm like, I don't. Oh, uh, we can talk about. Yeah, I, I, God, I really. You know, it, it's a bummer to have to keep going back to like sexual predation. But so there's 80 percent of the way through the book. It's like, surprise, there's a serial killer named also named Greg. No, named. Gary, Gary, the Gary. serial killer just shows up. And, um, you know, of course, Gradaniel is, like, must kill. So he, like, hunts down Gary and all of his accomplices and kills them all in various Except ways. Except one. There's one that he lets live. No. He gives him a nicer death so he can be with his wife in the uh -huh. afterlife. His wife's ghost shows up. Ghost wife shows up and is like, ah. um, Yeah, it's got ghosts. It's got everything. <laughs> That's one of the ghost wives out. Can make. you think of something? It's in here. Um. <laughs> I, like I like at one point there's just no discussion at all of this and then all of a sudden the family has a dog and you're like wait what and then it's never brought up again and then at another point in the book it's like his sisters his other sisters and you're like wait plural and he's like Joanna and you're like wait but what about the other ones and I think it's funny that he's like yeah my mom had to move out of her house and live in a condo but I can like rewrite reality I'm not gonna fix this <laughs> like, you can just like, give her a house, bro. You can well, give her a and he, he's living in the condo and is like <laughs> mad about it. It's like, bro, you have the power here. You don't even have to like eat or like feel cold or anything, <laughs> right? Like what <laughs> You murdered entire alien civilizations. You committed genocide by your own admission. You You're like, I have, to live in, I have to live in this condo with my <laughs> mom. You can't buy a fucking house. These fucking boomers, man, they just <laughs> they took everything from us. <laughs> Even God can't get a house in this market. 
Oh, that's how you know real estate's out of control. Oh, of control. I can't even rewrite the fucking property. <laughs> Yeah, that's why that's why Cole's, you know, in another dimension. He couldn't yeah. even afford anything in this dimension. He sits anymore. on a stump in a barren wasteland <laughs> yeah. because he can't find rent anyway. Yeah, man. The elder god market. Oh, it tanked long ago. Like Listen, they're all man, fucked. you try getting a job when your only experience is I created reality from nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out you need eight years of experience creating reality before they let you do anything. <laughs> You know, it's really hard to get eight years of experience when I haven't even created time yet. <laughs> <laughs> How am I supposed to measure this? <laughs> How do I write a resume? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I didn't create trees to make paper yet. <laughs> oh, there's even a, okay. The, like similarly, there's a scene where sorry, we're talking about the serial killers, and we got off track. Can All I talk about the part where like they're fly, he's flying with Julia, and like he mentions her pants keep falling off? Yes, haha, haha, haha. Well, so, ha, ha, I've seen it all, but like then Julia's like, "Can't you just make pants that won't fall off?" And he's like, "Huh, I guess I could, but I won't." I'm like, what, what, why? Yeah, I. Oh, okay. Oh. Anyway, Gary the serial killer is just a a thing that. It's a reason for Gridanuleg to seem like a benevolent being because he's out here finding and rooting out the, the predators and murdering them on a whim because he well, gets to be judge, jury, and perfect executioner. Yes. And the other thing, though, is like like I said, he kills Julie's dad without a second thought when he finds out that her dad, I mean, it seems like he abused Julie's friends and other women. And he just kills him. But then he mentions, I brought this up before, he mentions that his own father had um, abused his sister, Joanna, and his aunts. And that's why his father wasn't allowed to see anyone else in the family. But I still don't understand why he would be able to see his son. Because it's not like they gender lock, uh, you know, order restraining orders when you're a sexual predator. They're like, oh, you can see your son, but not your daughter. I, I just don't, I don't know if that's real. Is that a thing? Do they, do they? I mean, you can get individualized restraining orders, but I still think someone that, I, he's not in jail or anything either, so I'm assuming this yeah. wasn't found out by the law, and it was just the rest of the family saying you can't be around the women in the family. Oh, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I misread that. Maybe I thought that it was but like But even a legal still, thing. why would the family be like, oh, but your son's fine? Yeah, and why as the kid would you be like, oh, my dad raped my sister. I'm going to go live with him in the summer. Also, I'm a reality rewriting god who murders sexual predators all the time, but not my dad, who I don't even like that much. Yeah, this is the point I was getting to. And then he doesn't view his girlfriend as a sexual predator. But, I mean, I'm sure we can have arguments about this as she was a child as well. She was 14 when she, you know, started a relationship with a 10-year-old. But, like, again, really weird standards here where we're enforcing... <laughs> things for some people and not for others i'm not saying he should have murdered her i'm saying that like he never even considers that their relationship is a problem if it were a 14 year old boy and a 10 year old girl you know that would be a problem for anyone am i wrong about this no <laughs> no you're not there's an insane double standard when it comes to uh sexual predation and gender and um, yeah, so again, we have this this reality rewriting God who's going to murder anyone who even, I don't know, looked at a woman wrong, but then his own girlfriend <laughs> and himself have a very problematic relationship that um, I think many people would consider predation. And it's just, it's just fine. Julie's cool. I gave Julie powers too. She's cool now. She can, I don't know. She, can, she has the same abilities he has, assumedly, except she has a blue rock in her head because girl, I guess. Because he made a rock. Because I guess he can just do that now. It's fun. Um, yeah. It, uh, I don't know. Um, also, he gonna, laughs at her for, like, taking part in, like, regular human experiences, like taking a bath or whatever. But he will also still engage in regular human experiences himself. Yeah. He mentions he doesn't need to eat or do anything. And, and for me, I'm just like. So what he kind of explains, like, one of your notes here is, like, what's the story, right? And I think what he tries to explain is that bad aliens had suppressed his powers, and then the good alien came to try to take out those suppressants, 
which and and I guess succeeded, which is why he suddenly has powers. And you find out that he was born a human, but the rock in his brain was actually from the creator goddess. But there's nothing to really like tell you how any of that's connected. And furthermore, you never really understand why he doesn't remember the initial alien abductions and only remembers the newer ones where the aliens trying to take stuff out. We don't get any explanation as like how this rock got in his head if he was just born there. that way. And it's not really a fun story when you just get the ability to solve all your problems without having to do anything. Yep. Wouldn't it be easy if in life uh, just the solutions to my problems were just dropped in my lap? What, wouldn't it be so easy? Wouldn't life be so easy, Paris, if I had a brain rock that allowed me to create my own perfect reality? <laughs> yeah. If only yeah. we all had our brain rocks. If only. And then at the end, he, like, gives up. I forgot to I think we forgot about this. He kind of gives up control to the Earth Mother after he recreates her. And he mentions that um, Cull's daughter had done what I was afraid to do. She didn't acknowledge opinions or cultures and simply rebuilt the world in the way she deemed fit. Because isn't that the best thing to do? Just force your ideas on yeah. the entire world. Fuck everyone. Do whatever and you, you want. you must be the right one because someone decided that you're, you must do. Again, just saying she rewrote it as she sees fit. Maybe it, give me a couple things that what that might mean. Maybe one, just a crumb, please. Please, a crumb of something interesting, sir. Oh, man. I guess the one interesting... Oh, God's a rapist, too. I forgot. Oh, yeah, that. That's sure. why God had to die, ultimately. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. Yep. Sorry, had to just make sure that was known. I Ugh. guess the one, you had this note in here. The one sort of maybe interesting idea is, like, black brain rock superpowers, right? There's maybe you could have written something around that. Something. Yeah, maybe you could have been like, I was I was working construction and there was an explosion and a rock got embedded in my brain and, you know, now I, I don't know, after all this recovery, the doctors don't want to take it out because it's too dangerous and, I don't know, I started noticing that I had powers. By the way, I was working at like a nuclear reactor site. I don't know, like, yeah. like anything like that could have been fine, you know, explaining that you got something lodged in in your body that then affected your body's chemistry or your neurology um, and gave you some kind of powers. And but reality negative... rewriting power is not very interesting because yeah. there's no conflict, like you said. Maybe no a conflict. negative consequence or two somewhere in here, even when you murder Julie's father and she's like upset about it for 10 pages a where you fly second. away. <laughs> She, you come back and immediately she's willing to maybe go up against God for you. At first she's like, nah, I, I'd rather not, dude. That's kind of like a little much. I was just taking a bath. It's, you know, a <laughs> little much. Yeah. I, my, I had a different plan on my Tuesday here. But she's like fine with everything after that because God forbid there's a negative consequence to your perfect world. Yeah, I, yeah, this again, this is a. This is just an underdeveloped group of ideas kind of in chronological order. It's not, it shouldn't have been published. It should have been reworked many times. Needs many more drafts and many other people to look at it and point out these things <laughs> so that you don't put out a book that has, you know. Uh, Anything of here. Uh, you know what? Yes. <laughs> I don't think this. Okay, so should we head on over to Can We Fix It, perhaps? Yeah, sure. Take us away. Um, no. No, you cannot fix this. <laughs> there okay, was, I have a different opinion, but continue. I, the, there's, uh. the one thing is, like, there's perhaps a little kernel of cosmic horror in here that could have worked in some way of, like, you know, the non-Euclidean sleep space, and the protagonist doesn't even know his real name, and there's a weird alien and black mind rocks kind of happening here and it does when you read this you do feel uneasy the whole time which i suppose because you don't know where the next sentence is going to take you yeah. grammatically <laughs> so i suppose there's like a mild bit of you know okay it, that bit of tone is working but it doesn't work in a way where you're into it it's just pure confusion 
in a way that doesn't lend itself to the cosmic horror tone totally besides just the confusion and not building that confusion into something horrifying. It's just separate. The horror and the confusion are somewhat separated in a way that does not gel together. And I like, that's about it. Like the rest of this is, it just turns into the eclipse of darkness, but through the lens of a video game obsessed child in the last hundred pages, plus some random pedo shit for reasons. Yeah. So I don't think there's much to salvage here. And, you know, everyone's piled on to Anision at this point on the internet well enough that I'm not going to get into, like, any speculation on his mental state or what have you besides uh, this is not even a rough draft. I I suppose if a 12-year-old came to me with this and asked, like, what's good? Can I fix this? I'd be like, well, you completed a story. You have follow through to complete a, a something. It's in chronological order, <laughs> right? Like, there's that, yeah. and that's no. about it. I mean, there's there's plot points. You know, he has like there are ideas, but again, I mean, like like Chris has just said, this thing needs would need serious multiple serious revisions. There's nothing in it that's really compelling, um, and it, and it's very poorly written because it, it's not a finished work. Um, furthermore, it introduces heavy topics like children having sex, serial murder, alien abduction, and torture, but it doesn't engage with them even once in a mature and nuanced way. From what I understand, you know, like I said, I don't really know much about Onision, but it seems like he has some level of notoriety and cash flow, presumably, so he just needs to, like, divert that cash to paying professional editors to help him along with these ideas. You know, maybe he could even use that money to take writing classes. I don't know, man. Anything is possible when you have fucking internet money, right? Like, I, I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding uh, his level of fame and fortune, but, I mean, he must make some decent amount of money. He was uh, able to pay off a $90,000 fine for clearing endangered, like, wild land behind his house because okay, he just didn't Okay, that I have look. a problem with. You stay away from the wetlands, man. That's... That's fucked up. Don't don't fuck with that shit. Yeah, he destroyed a part of it behind his house. Oh, come on. Man, you know, this is why I try not to read too much about these internet people before we do these books because it's just bad news all the way down. Anyway, I don't know. I it, It's hard. Part of me is like, I don't want to speculate and talk out of turn, but the other part of me is like, how many times can you talk about child sex abuse in a book, never deal with it, and then be like, this isn't a problem in my life. This is fine. It's like, I don't know, man. He, if this, if this is one of those things where he's like trying to work some stuff out, I think therapy would make more sense. Or like, if you are going to try to work some stuff out by writing, maybe, maybe you don't need to publish it or maybe you don't need to publish the first draft or. Yeah. Take this to the therapist, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. And the therapist can be like, so you would, would you like to be a reality rewriting god? Let's explore this. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and I know this, I know we've had a lot of laughs today, um, but when someone presents all these really heavy topics and then just like doesn't deal with them, just points at them, it's concerning. <laughs> um, it's. I think it's just indicative of things that this author needs to work through in his private life. Uh, and maybe uh, perhaps try not to be so public about it, which I probably tough at this point, considering your entire whole existence seems to be placing things in the public view. But maybe that yeah. should change a little bit. Well, I mean, then again, maybe this is just a way to get more attention and therefore more money because Negative press is still good press, right? That's that classic phrase. I mean, maybe he knows this isn't good, but he doesn't care because people like to laugh at it because they know who he is. Um, I mean, that's also a possibility too. But again, I have no idea. And I and I don't really feel like I want to go down this rabbit hole. Um, onion hole. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what you're saying, Paris, is like to fix this, there needs to be other things that are fixed first. Yeah. I, well, and I just think that, and again, I'm making an assumption here about him not having editors or help because it, the work is so poor that it's hard to believe that anyone could have assisted him. So again, I'm I'm just using the clues that I have, which yes. is, which are the book, <laughs> uh, you know, to make these suggestions. And I, 
yeah, man, like if you got money, take some writing classes, like hire professionals to help you. If you really do want to become an author, if this isn't just a publicity stunt, um, you know, and also see a therapist because it really seems like you got some stuff you gotta you gotta work through. And that's so. just generally good advice for most people, regardless of how you think you're doing in your life. Per, yeah, you know, that's fair. That's take fair. a minute, take a month or two. Right? It doesn't have to be like this ongoing thing even. Maybe even just a few sessions could perhaps do you some good. I did that and it really helped me out. Like really, I, I went to a therapist for like three months and I got some tools that really are working for me. Yeah. And and I'm not yeah, I'm not trying to say like, oh, you're broken, you gotta see a therapist. Therapists are for broken people. I'm saying no. like therapists are for everyone. And and just to me, this is my opinion, someone that introduces really serious topics and then just like writes them off and doesn't deal with them is just a sign of troubling things that need to be handled I mean, by professional. No one's a reality rewriting God being that can make their perfect life, right? So you probably need some tools to handle right. just existing out here. Yeah. Life is a cosmic horror story, my friend. <clears throat> Get some tools. Get some tools. All right. Well, on that fucking note, I don't know that... I don't know. Do we, do we want to just do we just scroll through my notes and find sure, some, this, some fun? I, there was fun a fun thing. line, a fun misprint that, or like a oh, spelling a few, error. A few um, one that I really liked was mentioning a. F he was trying to talk about a fly with its wings, you know, destroyed. But he puts it, it it's the fly with its wigs destroyed. So I just imagine this poor little fly with its wig shelf just completely <laughs> eradicated. He's like, ah. no, I had a performance tonight. Buzzed. I had to do fly karaoke. <laughs> God damn it. Um, yeah, there's just, uh, there's so many weird things in this book. So I, at the very beginning, you can see my notes are my brain breaking as I try to construct the non-Euclidean furnace bedroom. I have a note that says, there, there's a, a line that says, oh, the furnace blasting in my ears. And I was like, wait, do you live in the furnace room? And then it says, the tiny window at the base of my bed. And my next note is, so you live in a bunk bed above a furnace with a floor window? What in sweet Ikea hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> like, I just couldn't figure it out. And, and then right after that, he's like, I looked out my window um, to see my sister playing with our geese. And I was like, get her away from them. Geese are <laughs> not to be played with. Geese are vicious and they bite. Their geese are not like, oh, my daughter's playing with the cute geese. No, they'll fuck you up. Geese are not cute play animals. Um, <clears throat> There's a point where he mentions, like, he goes over a friend's house that was his grandparents' house. It oh, all of his family lives in, like, the same neighborhood. Like, but is, is the friends his grandparents? Or did they die uh, and leave it to the friends? No, no, no. The grandparents are there. They still they still exist. He puts it um, as my friend's house before he yeah. mentions the grandparents thing. Yeah, I think that's just him not editing this ever. Um <coughs> uh, How about Oh, a night oh my my measly nine hundred square foot home and I wrote a spacious Boston palace. Which is <laughs> <laughs> why I had further problems figuring out why he was living in the furnace room. I was like, yo, you give me nine hundred square feet, I can make that real good. Paris, real I think good. you live in like a maybe four fifty square feet area. No, actually Not I would like to say that I live in a non Euclidean attic in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> that is I think technically it's like 750 square feet, but it is not a non-Euclidean attic. So the the, the uh, slanted roofs really kill a lot of that floor space. <laughs> so, no, it's true, though. They really do because, like, yeah. you can't fit the same amount of stuff. So as a person who lives in a non-Euclidean Ikea hell world, I can say <laughs> that this was confusing even for me. Um, How about the line where he's like, talking about he's missing one eye because of alien reasons and he goes well i no but 2020 or i guess just 20 vision i get I, so you did have to explain the joke here to me paris but at the same time that 20 slash 20 doesn't mean your left eye and your right eye 
That's not what that means. It means at 20 feet, you can see what the average person can see at 20 feet. I would say you would know this because you are an expert. (laughs) Because legally, the definition of legally blind is 20 over 200, which means for me, and I'm kind of right on this line, actually, what I perceive at 20 feet is what the average person perceives at 200 feet. God damn. So... It's not left eye, right eye, and your two different eyes can have separate measurements. And I believe, like, the legally blind, legally blind definition specifies that the ev- if even one of your eyes is better than that, you're not legally blind. So for me, this has mm. both of my eyes are that level. And I just was like, that, that, this is very stupid. You don't know what that means. Why didn't you look up what that means before you made this? Yeah, why, why do you not know? I'm... Chris is like, I'm fucking blind. I know. I took personal offense. Personal offense. Um, th- like, there's a line where he he's fat shaming his sister, like, the, on page two of the book. Says her clothes are too tight for her plump body type. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, the wood floor my mom painted white as a result of our pets peeing on our former carpet till it was unbearable. Hey, pro tip, you don't fix urine stains on a wooden floor by painting over it that's not how that works definitely not how that works it would just seal it in really (laughs) i mean also your wood floor should be treated so that any liquid doesn't seep into the wood just like white wall paint i can't imagine that's pleasant to walk on also like he gets a rip in his shirt. He just throws his shirt in the trash. Just doesn't even think about bleaching or mending it. You know, it gets, I think it gets damaged. Just throw it away. Cause he kind of has this, he, he builds up this idea that they're sort of poor, you know, not very fortunate. So why would you just throw a shirt away? I didn't throw shirts away. I still don't throw shirts away. It's a problem. I have a whole pile of clothes that I just can't bear to throw away. His family's um, got enough money for him to be playing video games, like current era video games. Eh, some of us rented those games. Some of us they were definitely not rented in this book because he's playing Final no, Fantasy VII for like years. <laughs> that's true. Um, oh, sorry. Does does Ohio have blazing humidity and ninety to one hundred degree summers? I've never been to Ohio, and I was kind of surprised by that, but I don't know anything that's about the, that. It. Feels right. It's like yeah, generally okay. lower latitude than Boston, right? Yeah, but Isn't it? blazing humidity, it's in the middle of the country. Isn't there a lake near it? I don't know. Yeah, it, maybe it, there's it, a it's lake. It's a Great at the Lakes top of region it. state. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I, I was just like, huh, interesting. I didn't know that. Um hmm. Oh yes, having blonde hair and blue eyes means you're automatically beautiful unless you have a thick Amazonian body type and bad breath, as he explains. He's talking shit about his classmate, some girl that likes him, and he's like, she had blonde hair and blue eyes. No, I know you think that sounds good, but it's like, why does no, that mean different anything? Types. There's different types. People can like different things, guy. Mm-hmm. Some people like the Amazonian body type. People, you know, really into that Wonder Woman movie for Gal Gadot being kind of hot, and she's, she, right? Like, I guess she's kind of thin, not really Amazonian, but like, the Yeah, same I don't time. actually know what her body type Literally is. from like, an Amazonian stand-in country. <sighs> and then there are, you know, even then we have the whole other, I don't know if you've been on this uh, side of the internet lately, but uh, have you heard about Resident Evil 8 and the uh, villain character being a nine foot six tall vampire lady that everyone is super into? No, nine foot six? Nine foot six vampire lady and That's everyone is very... like, step on me, please, mom. Uh, uh... <laughs> like well, uh, we'll talk about that in the next episode that we're recording right after this. Literally. That's something that we're going to talk sure, about. Sure. I'll bring up Lady Dimitrescu later. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just pulling random stuff from the notes. Uh, he told her to go F herself. Only he didn't just say F. Is an <laughs> actual line from this book. Once again, kind of a childish way to put things. Uh, he also consider- thinks that his bully getting beat up but like he beat his bully up and then he went to the principal's office and he was like oh man seeing someone's life come apart like that (laughs) he just got sent to the principal's office buddy it's gonna be fine he didn't get expelled or anything he did sled into a creek and die later but that was separate and later (laughs) from this coming apart apparently i remember at the beginning being really confused and thinking this kid was in high school because he's like asking 
a girl on a date to the mall and I'm like, you're 10. <laughs> I don't know. Do 10 year olds do that? Sure. Why um, not? I don't know. 10 year olds definitely, you know, start to like girls or uh, rather girls. Like, oh, yeah, like sure. Other but, the other gender or whatever they're attracted but to. Going on dates by yourself to the mall at 10 seems a little young. Yeah, you're probably going to have some parental supervision around there. Yeah. I don't know. What do I know? I'm not a parent, but. Um, oh, Daniel, <laughs> this is a great awkward sentence. David avoided me before as a result of death and began talking to me again as a result of death. Great I guess writing. that was because the Philip uh, Creek accident thing. Mm -hmm. And before he stopped talking because of some other dead body thing. Yes. Uh, just finding some wonderful... Wonderful sentences. <laughs> One of my notes is this boy is encased within a home appliance. <laughs> because slowly. again, again, you might say, wow, it's really weird that you guys keep taking notes on that. It's like, well, it's really weird that he keeps yeah. bringing it up. Yeah. So. <laughs> He's slowly getting encased in a house of leaves style <laughs> of house organs thing, but it's only that room. Oh, I remembered I was highly pro. He's like, Fact is, I had a heart condition, or so I thought I did, but every doctor I went to couldn't identify what it was. I remembered I was highly prone to passing out and should probably get some calories in my body. And I was like, is it your heart or do you just not eat enough? Like, which is it? Is it your heart or do you need food? Those aren't the same. This is really weird. Oh, uh, a woman comes to their house and he can tell that her baby uh, died before she was able to give birth, you know, so the child is stillborn. And he's like, great, my spring bake is ruined. Now I have to think about a dead baby, I said to myself. Like, the level of narcissism there about maybe this is more her issue that she has to deal with. He does say, like, oh, I realize that wasn't great of me to say, but, like, it's just... <laughs> Oh, yeah. Here's the line. The moment you even mention a special ed kid, they immediately consider writing you up for a hate crime. No, that's no, no. that's you, not how you this, can no. speak about them and talk to them and no people don't flip out about it. <sighs> it's like how you do it. And if, it, if in your experience, that's what happens, you should probably examine how you approach these subjects. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a car accident with a family. And some other car, and the dad's like, oh, you guys should just walk home. I'll deal with the police. I'm like, you shouldn't make anyone leave the scene of a crime. <laughs> and perhaps a car a accident idea. where, you know... Someone died, by the someone way. Someone died. There might be some injuries to take care of as well. Just nah, just head on home. Grab some McDonald's on the way. Here's five bucks. Oh, his, his detailed mashed potatoes and chicken nuggets scene. Uh, so, like I said, there are things that, like, should be given attention that aren't. And then he's like... I continue to eat my mashed potatoes and chicken nuggets alone, a 12-seat table sitting by myself. I would dip the chicken nuggets in the mashed potatoes, scoop some of the potatoes up to my mouth with the nuggets, eat and repeat. Sometimes when I got thirsty, I would just drink my chocolate milk and think about how much I hated everyone at this point. Thanks for the, I drank my milk when I was thirsty. And had detail. my nuggies. I had my nuggies <laughs> and Wait had a minute. my milk. A 12-seater table in a small apartment? No, this is at school. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah. God was just the guilt that made us responsible enough to show up every week. That was the one line you thought That's was like maybe fine. That's like the one kind of okay thing. But again, when God literally exists in this universe, I guess not. Uh, Paris, I think we don't have to do yeah. any more. That's plenty. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm ready to fucking... Drown myself in the Reaper's Creek. That's that's how I feel right now. So we've done it for you. Many people that have clamored uh, about reading an Onision book. We did it. It's over. We never have to do it again. Her, people really wanted us to read Stones to Abigail, but I feel like that was much more gone over by other like book reviewer types already. So yeah. we went for this, the latest one, in the hopes that perhaps something was developed. I can't imagine what the first work was like if this was the third try. I mean, this feels like maybe a Maradonia syndrome where it's just the same level of quality no matter what. Um, but even but even the Secret of Moon Lake was a little better, Paris. Yeah, but that was that was like book six. Seven? I guess <laughs> I forget. 
I don't know. But Tesh improved. Yeah, she was also younger. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you to our patrons for making this show possible. Because of them, we can read terrible Anissian books and review them for you. So you don't have to. Thank you to Dari, Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared, Lynn, Senia, Bobby Blackcat, Jen Cena, Mayo Cat, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Jay, Scott, Luchek, CTAP1, Miri, and our newest patron, OS. Woo! Mis- the mysterious OS. Welcome. Welcome to the, to the group. If you also want to help support, support the show, you can subscribe on YouTube. It costs zero dollars and you have to click a button one time. It's a pretty good way to support yeah. us and it requires very little effort. Um, fun fact. Smash we, that like button. Subscribe. Subscribe button. Um, fun fact. We are two dollars away from hitting our next funding goal on Patreon, which will secure some free merch to all current patrons and maybe some new designs on that. We're merch working program. on something in that area yeah. since that's kind of imminent. So if you are a patron at the point that we reach the $100 funding goal, you will be the recipient of some new free TBC merch. Um, And that is free, free. You do not have to pay for anything that we send you. No shipping fees. We're just going to send you some free stuff for being a patron and getting us to that mark. But you have to be a patron when that happens. So you can donate a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars a month on Patreon to become part of this group and access videos, Mystery Science Theater 3000 style commentary on bad TV and movies, outtakes, and other random audiovisual weirdness, including our latest content series, Lost The Lost Pages, Pages of Maradonia. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Goodreads if you're on those platforms. Uh, most importantly, though, we'd really love if you shared the show on social media and told someone about it, or um, you could write a review. We've actually had a couple people write reviews recently, which was really, really great. We really appreciate that. Thank um, you. Yeah, thank you for heeding our repeated cries for more reviews and ratings. Um, and if we keep getting reviews, we'll keep reading them. So these are our two most recent ones. Um, BB and Kelly on Apple Podcasts US says, Five stars, one of my favorite podcasts. Love the show and the chemistry between hosts. They're both pretty funny. They've dug up some seriously crazy books, and I'm glad I'm a listener, because otherwise I would never have known about them. Thanks, BB. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly BB. Um, Anna Rona via Apple Podcasts in Belgium. Are you bored? Five stars. <laughs> Look no more. I listened to episodes about Gloria Tesh. Too funny. Here's another internet person episode for you. <laughs> yes. Um, Thank you for listening. Anyway, um, really appreciate listeners. Uh, especially, It's really fun when we get international folks, which we seem to quite a bit, weirdly. So thanks, uh, Anna Rona in Belgium. And thanks, uh, BB in California. It's not another country, but California's far. So <laughs> <Might as well. laughs> I'll take it. Thank you both uh, for those lovely reviews. And we'll, uh, we'll read yours next if you care to leave one. If you want to just contact us directly, you can send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com or you can send a message to us on Patreon, Goodreads, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. All right, Paris. Well, uh, we've done it. We've answered the call and we read another internet person book. Um, well, you know, um, we'd like to do these once in a while. I feel like we're always kind of a little bit late to the party on these. But people seem to enjoy them, just, you know, even if other people have talked about it before. Perhaps they're just looking for more perspectives on things. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. I I don't know that I really feel any certain way about it. It's just another terrible book. It's another terrible uh-huh. book. Where um, next book, we are returning to something that we kind of did earlier in the year, but it was a patron request, too, so... Um, get your patron requests in if you still haven't, I suppose, because the spots are getting eaten up and the schedule is, you know, we're already in March here. Yeah, but the schedule is built out through, like, November. <laughs> so. Sure, but, like, if a patron puts a request yes, in, we'll alter correct. things for their, for their sake is what I'm saying. Correct, so that is what we do. If you're a $10 patron, I believe, at this point, is where yeah. you get to have a say in what we read, and that yeah. is happening in the next episode. Um, and we'll see how that one goes. It's certainly another uh, quickie. Yeah, and uh, there's going to be a big woman touching stuff with her feet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not kidding. That's that's all right. A... Well, there's your preview, everyone. See uh... you next time. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, ter- bye, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to alter reality so I don't say that ever again. <laughs> 
it's me, the reality altering <laughs> god that can edit the podcast to his whims. <laughs> ah! uh, it's true. It's true. You are uh, Christian. Oh no! Uh, 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 I have to take a bath now. Bye, Paris. No, just rewrite the code so I never say that to you. Oh, bye, Paris. <laughs> <laughs> bye, Chris.